halogenation and halohydrin formation. That'll be the topic of this lesson. Uh, in a halogenation reaction, we add an equivalent of a halogen, either Cl2Br2, I2, in an inert solvent, and it adds two molecules of that halogen across the alkene. And because you're adding two of exactly the same thing, there is no regioselectivity, so no Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov. Uh, but we'll find out if it matters that it is an anti-addition for the stereoselectivity, and also does not go through a carbocation, so no carbocation rearrangements are possible. Now, for halohydrin formation, so instead of carrying the reaction out in an inert solvent, we carry it out in either water or an alcohol. And in that case, you're still going to add a bromine, but potentially an OH or an OR group across the alkene instead. We'll find out that it is Markovnikov addition, which will be a little bit tricky of what that exactly means, but we'll definitely cover that. Uh, we'll also find out that just like uh, halogenation, it is also an anti-addition. And just like halogenation, it does not go through a carbocation intermediate and therefore is not subject to rearrangements. Now this is part of my new organic chemistry playlist. I'll be releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you don't want to miss one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. You'll be notified every time I post a new lesson. The next alkene addition reaction here is halogenation. And we are going to add a halogen to both sides of the alkene, usually chlorine and chlorine or bromine and bromine. So typically the way it works, and because we're adding two of the same thing, again, there is no regioselectivity, so no Markovnikov, no more anti-Markovnikov to even talk about. So, but it turns out this one is an anti-addition, and it turns out this is going to involve a three-membered ring with a halogen this time, not with mercury, like an oxymercuration demercuration. So, but involving that three-membered ring, we're going to be doing backside attack on an sp3 hybridized atom again, and that's why it's going to result in anti-addition, as we'll see. All right, so if we kind of take a look at how this works, we'll just predict a couple products and then we'll work through the mechanism here. And so we'll kind of use our standard alkene here. And if we had Br2 and CH2Cl2, we would add a bromine to both sides. Cool. Now, where I added the bromine on the left substituted carbon, that did not turn into a chiral center. It's got two hydrons. So, but this one did. And again, if you form one chiral center, no matter which alkene reaction you're talking about, you will always form both versions, R and S. And so this would not be a sufficient answer here. You'd have to draw both enantiomers. So you could get that version of the chiral center or this version of the chiral center. Notice, again, this bromine, a lot of students have asked me, well, Chad, why aren't you showing wedges or dashes here? Well, it's not a chiral center. It only can exist in one form, regardless of how you draw it. You can make this a wedge, a dash, or the, the bond in the plane. It's the same thing either way. But here at a chiral center, it totally matters. It's a different stereoisomer depending on how you represent it. And so we had to definitely uh, show that there. Cool, but just two products. Now, on the other hand, what if we formed two chiral centers like we're about to in this one. So I'm going to add a bromine to both sides yet again. So, and in this case, we do form two chiral centers. And when you form two chiral centers, that's when your stereoselectivity matters. And again, this is anti-addition. And so in this case, you have to add the two things you add, in this case, two bromines, to opposite faces. And what that means is one's going to be a wedge and the other one a dash. But you could do this the other way as well. The top one could have been the dash and the bottom one, the wedge. And these are enantiomers. This is not a meso compound. In this case, both bromines would have had to be both wedges or both dashes for it to be meso. So not a meso. These are enantiomers, and you get them both in this example. Cool. I want to also show the mechanism for this last one as well. All right, so in this case, we know the first step that the alkene is gonna be the nucleophile every time. And in this case, he's gonna come and attack bromine. And again, you might think, well, are we gonna form a carbocation? And we are not going to form a carbocation because again, just like mercury, bromine's got electrons. And he's like, oh, no, no, don't form a carbocation. I will also attack you back and form that three membered ring. Now, it turns out when we attack the bromine, the other bromine does break away and leave, so to speak. Which takes us here. All right, so we've got this lovely three-membered ring with bromine. When we had a three-membered ring with mercury and a positive charge, we called it a mercurinium ion. This one's called a bromonium ion. 
Had it been with chlorine, it would have been called a chloronium ion. Or for any generic halogen, we call it a halonium ion. So I just want you to be familiar with those terms. We also formed another bromide ion here as well. Cool. Now I haven't shown any stereochemistry here on my intermediate, but technically those are chiral centers. And so I should be showing some stereochemistry. Well, they have to be bonded on the same side. I can't have one, you know, bonded out in front of the board, one behind the board, because they're bonded the same thing, the same exact atom. So they're either both wedges or both dashes, and it's really my choice. In fact, it's the same thing either way, because it's a meso in this case. So I'll make them both wedges, but what I really just want to emphasize is now we've got to do backside attack. And this bromide here, these two carbons are both equivalent, so it doesn't really matter which one we attack. If one of them was more substituted than the other, though, that bromide would prefer the more substituted one. These two carbons share the partial positive charge, so or they share that positive charge of the bromine, so they're partially positive, and whichever one is more substituted will have more of that partial positive charge, and bromide can attack it with greater attraction and lower activation energy, so to speak. But in this case, it totally doesn't matter. And so we'll come and do backside attack. Again, when you attack an sp3 carbon, it's gotta be from the backside. And it's backside relative to the leaving group. And in this case, the leaving group's the bromine. Now, I realize the, the bromine's not leaving the entire molecule, but it is leaving that carbon. And so as a result, So the top carbon had a bromine attached as a wedge. The new one's going to be attaching from the back face as a dash. Cool. Had I decided to attack the bottom one instead, then it would have been the other enantiomer instead. Cool. And that's again why we do the anti-addition, this backside attack of an sp3 carbon uh, in the intermediate. All right, so this is halogenation. So we use an inert solvent with our halogen, and the two most common inert solvents are CCl4 and CH2Cl2. And technically, these are pretty common inert solvents. In fact, if you did the reaction with HBr, you probably did it with one of these solvents, except we didn't take the time to draw it out for you. Well, there's a reason we didn't take the time to draw it out for you, because it didn't matter. But here it does, because we have an option. When you're doing halogenation, you can do it with an inert solvent, and exactly as we see. Or you can do it with a reactive solvent, which is usually a water or an alcohol is most common. So, and all of a sudden those actually participate in the reaction. And instead of adding two halogens, we'll get a slightly different reaction as we're about to see. So this is halohydrin formation, along with your halogen, which again is typically Cl2 or Br2. We're either gonna use water or an alcohol instead. And so it turns out instead of adding two halogens, we're gonna add a halogen and either an OH or an OR, depending on if we used water or alcohol. And so in this example here, we're gonna add a chlorine on the less substitute side, and we're gonna add an OH on the more substitute side. And technically this is going to be Markovnikov. Now, a lot of students memorize Markovnikov as uh, the side with more hydrogens gets another hydrogen, like the rich get richer or something like that. But in this example, we don't add any hydrogen across the alkene. And so students often get confused on what Markovnikov means here if they memorize that kind of like overly simplistic version. So, but it turns out the halogen is gonna be adding as it gets attacked by the alkene. So adding as an electrophile. And so it's gonna end up on the less substituted side for Markovnikov. So, and then water or the alcohol is gonna be attacking back. So just like bromide attacked here, and we'll end up on the more substituted side, as we'll see. So I'm gonna use a slightly different alkene here. So, and if we predict our products, so our chlorine should end up on the less substitute side. And in this case, the OH on the more substitute side. And both of these turn into chiral centers. So we just form two chiral centers. And again, that's when stereoselectivity matters. And so forming two chiral centers, it's anti-addition. And so we're only gonna form two out of four possible stereoisomers, the two anti-versions. And so in this case, the anti means that the chlorine and the OH have to end up on opposite sides of the alkene, one a wedge and one a dash. And so we could have had the OH as the wedge, which would have meant the chlorine was a dash. But if the OH was a wedge, that also means that this methyl group up here was a dash as well. And we could have just as well got the enantiomer here also. In which case the OH would have been the dash and the methyl the wedge. And if the OH was the dash, the chlorine would have to be the wedge on this side, again, to be anti-addition. And so we get a pair of enantiomers yet again, two chiral centers form, but anti-addition. Let's take a look at that mechanism. All right. 
So in this case, we are going to first, again, with our alkene, come and attack chlorine. So that's going to cause the other chlorine to break off and leave. But rather than form a carbocation, this chlorine again is like, I got lone pairs. Don't form a carbocation. I will come and attach to the other carbon as well. And so in this case, I'm just going to attach the chlorines as wedges. They could just as well be dashes. So in here, it actually matters. This is not a miso. So, but I'm just going to choose the one where it's wedges. Just know it's actually a pair of enantiomers as our intermediate here. So, and the idea is that we also formed a chloride ion. And so now, normally, we'd have that chloride come and do backside attack. And we said it would be on the more substituted carbon, not the less. So, however, we used a solvent that's not inert this time around, water. And when you use water or alcohol, so they are actually weak nucleophiles. So, and in this case, they're weak nucleophiles. Chloride's a better nucleophile, but there's only one chloride, and he's the solvent. There's millions and zillions of them. And so as a result, the solvent preferentially gets to do the backside attack instead and open up that ring. So chlorine's still going to be attached to the other carbon, still as a wedge. So, but on this carbon where we did backside attack, so the chlorine was a wedged bond, the leaving group there. So the OH is going to be where the water attaches as the dash. And that flips inversion takes place, Walden inversion, causing the methyl group that used to be a dash to now be the wedge instead. And as we've seen in the past, when you've got a neutral nucleophile attacking and attaching and ending up with a positive formal charge, you'll have another molecule of the solvent deprotonate. And so we'll bring in another water molecule. Cool. And there is one of our products. And again, had we showed our lovely intermediate here with the two bonds to chlorine as dashes and the methyl group to the wedge, that's how we would have arrived at our other enantiomer as well. Oh, and just to make sure we're bouncing this correctly, she really should for any proper mechanism. We also formed some H3O plus. Cool, only difference here, have we used alcohol instead of water? So is everywhere you see an OH here, it would have been an OR, where the R would have just been indicative of what alcohol you use. Use methanol, OCH3. Use an ethanol, OCH2CH3. Same diff. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, consider giving me a like and a share, a couple of the best things you can do to help promote the channel. And if you've got questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Now, if you're looking for the study guide that came with this lesson, or if you're looking for practice problems, I've got quizzes and chapter tests and practice final exams, all part of my premium courses on chadsprep.com.